appreciate Dan uh, talking about hope. And uh, I uh, actually, uh, hope has had a tremendous impact on our own family. Uh, two of my daughters were able to participate uh, in Hope Youth Corps over the years. Uh, they're grown women now. And, uh, one of them has three of our five grandchildren and the other one was recently married, but they were able to go over to uh, South America and over to the Middle East. And uh, actually Jake got a chance, Graham, uh, to get to know my youngest daughter and they went on that trip together. And so they forever have a memory together but uh, uh, it is invaluable. And I think hope being the benevolent arm that it's been for our faith group for more than a couple of decades, uh, it really brings to life what Jesus talks about when it comes to the poor and the marginalized. And uh, as we all know, uh, Jesus was all for justice and Jesus was always about the poor. Uh, even Paul talks about, man, I only ask that you remember the poor and that that would bring him great joy. And so uh, if there are some candidates, please be sure to let Dan or myself know uh, if you're interested in uh, possibly heading up the chapter here um, and uh, to God be the glory. Do want to say happy birthday to uh, Mr. Daryl. I don't know how old Daryl is, but happy birthday, brother. And uh, hope you have a great day today. And uh, you enjoy your time with your family and uh, just uh, enjoy a, a, another year of, uh, of God giving you a life here in this life. So praise God for that. Also, an update, uh, we were going to have, for those of you that recall, we were going to have a Mid-South virtual memorial service was the plan. And Tom Brown, who you saw speaking, uh, it was great to see Tom and Bruce Williams. I've had the pleasure and honor of working with them in the ministry directly for a few years. And uh, uh, Tom was going to speak for our, uh, for our Mid-South service. But uh, last month, part, latter part of last month, and then going into this month, his wife, Kelly, uh, got infected with COVID and uh, it got very, very bleak. She was on a respirator. She was in critical condition. Um, she lost a tremendous amount of weight. For those of you that know Kelly or have seen Kelly Brown at all, she, she's a very thin woman to start off with. And uh, so uh, praise God, uh, many of us here and Certainly brothers and sisters literally all around the world were praying for the Browns and, and God always hears our prayers and uh, he allowed Kelly to stay with us. And so Kelly is at home now, she's recovering and uh, Tom has had a chance to talk with him on Thursday and obviously he's very happy. But uh, all that being said, uh, as you can imagine, uh, that's gonna be a long road to recovery and uh, I gave my two cents to a, a older brother that I thought it might be best that he take a rain check. And if you know Tom, if you've been around Tom, that's very hard for him. He loves his calling. He, uh, he's one of the most energetic, mature men I have ever been around. But uh, he did take it to heart. And so uh, he's going to have to take a rain check and, and understandably so. So as a result, uh, we are, for the Memorial Weekend, we'll have uh, service by house church, uh, whether if you want to host it yourself, have it yourself with your group, or if you want to visit uh, another church uh, elsewhere virtually online. But those are the plans. Continue to keep uh, the Browns in your prayers, and I'm sure we'll uh, have them sometime again uh, to him to speak to the church in the near future. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's go to the Father in prayer, and we'll get started with service as well, the lesson. God, thank you so much uh, for all that you do for us. Uh, be with me this morning. Help me to uh, move me out of the way, and Holy Spirit, help me to speak that you already 
uh, have and know the words, uh, how you want me to present God's message, his holy scriptures, uh, his scriptures that transformed our lives. Uh, God, we do pray for Bobby Gorley, uh, Justin's uh, cousin, relative, that uh, he had a stroke and uh, it's, been, uh, it's been very severe. And pray that uh, God, he could be comforted, uh, that you would uh, be with the Gorley family. And uh, Father, we uh, pray for anyone else that has been sick or bedridden. Thank you for uh, Ron uh, coming out of a surgery, that he's worshiping with us today and, and up and about. Thank you so much for that. And uh, God, we uh, thank you for our brother, Sean, and all that he has meant to us, the impact that he's had in our life. Uh, though we're sad to some degree, uh, I pray that we're more so rejoicing that he made it, uh, that he is waiting on us, uh, that he's in paradise, and uh, to you be the glory. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So um, we're going to finish up in uh, Isaiah, in chapter 10, in verse 24. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. My people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians, who beat you with a rod and lift up a club against you as Egypt did. Very soon, my anger against you will end and my wrath will be directed to their destruction. The Lord Almighty will lash them with a whip as when he struck down Midian at the rock of Oreb, and he will raise his staff over the waters as he did in Egypt. In that day, their burden will be lifted from your shoulders, their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat. They enter Ayath, they pass through Migron, they store supplies at Michmash. They go over the pass and say, we will camp overnight at Geba. Rama trembles, Gibeah of Saul flees. Cry out, daughter, Gilliam. Listen, Lasha, poor Anatoth, Madaman ends in flight. The people of Geban take cover. This day, they will halt at Nob. They will shake their fists at the Mount of Daughter Zion, at the hill of Jerusalem. See, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will lop off the bows with great power. The lofty trees will be felled, the tall ones will be brought low. He will cut down the forest with thickets with an ax. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. You know, uh, it is in clear and definite terms that the prophet Isaiah predicts the overflow or the overthrow rather of the enemy who was hammering at the very gate of Jerusalem. You know, early when we read verses 24 through 34, it's apparent that man at some juncture, right? As we've talked about that God was allowing a series to attack the church and to overwhelm them. But now God has determined that, you know what, I will turn all of the serious attacks on you back on them. God will prevent fear on the part of his people from the Assyrians. Literally all was fulfilled in due time so far as the prophecy had to do with the Assyrians of the past. When in the last days, another mighty army comes again against Israel from the same region in the north. His doom will be just as certain as was that of the Assyrians in the past. The progress of the Assyrians army marching down through the land is depicted graphically in the verses that close out chapter 10. Prophecy is history written beforehand. And here Isaiah foretold the path that the Assyrians would take as they marched through Palestine, wrecking city upon city, but the closing verses tell of his defeat at last when the Lord of hosts intervened with his mighty power for the deliverance of those who cried to him in the hour of their distress. And you know, we've talked about how there are so many parallels to today that God is kind of pulling back the curtain on the church where we are, we're dealing with pandemic and 
social justice, and God has allowed these things to happen to the church, to call us back to him, to return to loving him, to return to making him our true God and not wealth and power and comfortability and complacency, uh, to love justice. I appreciate how we talked about hope, to get back to the poor and the marginalized. I'm thankful that we have a, a hope chapter here now. And so as a result, God decided, and I believe he's starting to do that now, that God is starting to let up some and say, man, my, my church is starting to return back to me. And that he will turn Assyria or he will turn the United States or he will turn any nation back on itself because of their disobedience and rebellion and just lack of love towards him. And so uh, I want to get to the uh, best part of what I'm excited about today in terms of the sermon. And I want to honor Sean today. You know, uh, if you look over in Psalms chapter 116, And you may be thinking, what does Sean's home going have to do with God turning back on Assyria and God's going to fight for his church again? And hopefully, as I speak this morning, uh, I'll be able to connect the dots for you. But in Psalms 116, verse 15, precious is the sight of the Lord. In the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You know, when I got the news about Sean, like you, many of you, I initially for maybe a couple of minutes, maybe a few was sad. I know some of us said, man, I, I, just, I just saw Sean Wednesday night. He was in such great spirits. He was doing well. Some of us couldn't believe even a day or two or three later that he was gone. And yet, you know, uh, it's interesting for, for me, when we arrived here nearly five years ago, our sister Jean had just become a Christian. She was a much more mature woman. And uh, she had health problems. She got around in a wheelchair, was living off a respirator. And not too shortly after Shannon and I arrived, we ended up doing her home going. And I remember being at her home with her children. Her children, some of her children had to fly in from Denver, Colorado. And uh, we had a great memorial for her. And I remember just thinking, she made it. She became a disciple just in a nick of time. And she ain't in no wheelchair no more. And she ain't breathing off no respirator no more. And she's more healthier than you, than you will ever be in this lifetime. And I remember uh, Shannon and I being at the house and you know, her children were so thankful and one of her kids and her uh, in-laws were disciples and our disciples in, in Denver. And we had a great time remembering Jean. And so it didn't take too long, five years later, for me to think, Sean made it. He made it. Have you made it? I haven't made it. He's home. He's where we all want to be. You know, I've, I've heard it said, you know, man, you know, Sean had a lot of health issues. Served our country faithfully. Fought for our country. Was wounded. due to other complications, but those as well, 
had to have his leg amputated since I've been here. And I heard it said, you know, it was high maintenance. And you know, I got to thinking, before God, we're all high maintenance. <laughs> I started thinking, before God, who's a one of us that's not high maintenance? We're always going to God about something, crying about something, whining about something, asking about some blessing. As a side note, I wonder how much does that match to how much we praise him and worship him, but that's another lesson. You know, he had his, his struggles, but at, at the cross, I don't care how much money you have or how healthy you are or what retirement plan you have or what type of house you live in or what community, at the foot of the cross, we're all the same. I don't care what color you are, what creed, what ethnicity you are, we're all the same at the foot of the cross. And so it didn't take long for me. I just, man, I just started rejoicing. And this morning I was crying, thinking about him. You know, when I got here five years ago, Sean was not in a good spot spiritually. In fact, he had become a lost sheep. And uh, I remember so many of us got in there and started going after restoring Sean. And we had to talk through a lot. Sean was in a dark space. And many of us know how dark that space was. But man, I, I remember when we got him restored by the power of God. And you know, you, you start to understand more and more when you help brothers and sisters get restored, why God says he rejoices over that more than one who had never been saved and got saved. That the, the angels rejoice. You know, there are many brothers and sisters that have been involved with, with Sean prior to Sean's and I coming, but I certainly want to lift up the pilgrims and the forts, the storms, the grounds, and Hoyt. And, uh, you know, Sean was having his struggles, and I, I thought, man, you know what? I struggle. <laughs> I struggle all the time. In fact, isn't that what Paul says in Colossians 1, 28 and following that he struggles with all his energy so that the power of God may be evident in his life as he's trying to help the church? I think sometimes we focus so much on the struggles, we miss the power of God. About two months ago, Hoyt and Al and I were talking and, you know, Sean was having some struggles. He was going through it. As you can only imagine, right? We know how we felt over the last year, every 100 year pandemic, a fight for social justice, unlike we've seen since the civil rights movement. Can you imagine someone that's wheelchair bound, can't get out? how they feel, he was dealing with a lot. No different than us. He's fighting demons, just like we fight our demons. And so a couple of months ago, Alan Hoyt and I were talking and we we're like, man, we, we just wanna make sure Sean is ready. You know, he had been in and out of the hospital. 
At times it was very bleak. And uh, so we got together on Zoom. Hoyt now went over. And they pulled me up on Zoom and we read some passages about just being ready, being ready to meet God. You know, isn't that, isn't that what the scriptures tell us, particularly in the gospels, to be alert, to be ready. We don't, we don't know when he's going to come. We don't know when our time is going to be called. Our card is going to be pulled, as was the case with Sean. For some of us, we're like, are, are, are you sure that he passed away? Yeah, I'm sure. And so we talked. And then I, I got off Zoom and Alan Hoyt talked with him some more. He got open. He got clean. And so I couldn't be happier today. You say, yeah, Anton, okay, so amen, I, I get it. Sean, struggles, power, rejoicing, loss, lamb, we struggle, I get it. How does that tie into Isaiah and God's comforting words that He's going to turn Assyria back on its head. It's a war. See, for Sean, he probably got it like so few do. It's a battle. But unlike a physical war, man, you don't see the enemy. See, at least you can see the enemy come. You can look and dictate in some manners. Yeah, I get it, camouflage and techniques and all that. But it's not a spiritual. It's not completely invisible to the eye. That's the war we're in. You look over in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. Beginning verse 7. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Excuse me. And verse seven, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the rape. I have kept the faith. Sean has fought the good fight. He has finished the race and he has kept his faith in God. He's done. He ran the race marked out for him. He's done. He's there. I'm not there. You there? I don't know what awaits me. I only long to be where he is. See, that, that mortal body, the leg missing, dealing with stuff that Sean had to deal with. See, none of that matters now. A wheelchair, health issues. I remember the pilgrims and I, in 2019, were in the hospital. We were there to see the forts. And Ron's still here with us today. But what we see physically and what we deal with physically and mentally, see, when you finish the race, it's a moot point. What about an amputated leg? What about a wheelchair? 
What about being quarantined for over a year for the most part during a pandemic? What about, it doesn't matter. Sean is soul is sitting, resting in paradise and just looking at us, <laughs> praying, praying we make it. Cause see now, As an analogy, see, you have the amputated leg. See, you're in the wheelchair. See, you got to deal with all the physical and worldly and mental and emotional and physical stuff. Sean is free. You worrying about whatever. It's amazing. Doesn't even matter. Who of you would want to be in Sean's shoes right now? <laughs> like you weren't four to six days ago, and now you're like, yeah, I want to be in Sean. It's amazing. Amazing. Only God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And so when you talk about a good fight, you talk about a war, you always think about warfare and weapons. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse four, he says, for the weapons of our warfare or not of flesh, but had divine power to destroy strongholds. See, God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus destroyed all those strongholds that Sean was up against, mentally, physically, emotionally, by the grace and power of Jesus' blood and the resurrection from the dead, Sean captured all that. What you dealing right now? What are you dealing with mentally? What thoughts are running through your mind? Sean's free. I don't know about you, man. I, I got all kinds of stuff going on in my mind. And think about it. Challenge to worry about or get discouraged over or be excited about or be happy about. Or be this, I mean, it's not a flesh and blood. Sean's not a flesh and blood anymore. And then in verse five, he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Like Sean is done. That's for us. <laughs> he, he doesn't have to deal he doesn't have to deal with this anymore he doesn't have to deal with destroying the arguments and, and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God he doesn't have to fight in the spirit to take every thought captive to obey Jesus he's good that's for you and me but man I can follow his example what about you That's an example I can get with. Every single time it came to discipling, Sean responded like Jesus. Some of us don't even want discipling in our life. We won't let people get intimate with us. We won't be vulnerable. We won't be transparent. Last I checked, we're still here. Verse six, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look, I've never served in the military, but one thing I do know, 
Obedience is paramount. I know that much. And so it is for God. And every time when the chips were down, Sean obeyed Jesus. I mean, Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our lives. As of right now, knock on this table, my book's not finished. Neither is yours. Sean's book is finished. Complete. Got all his chapters in. What an ending. Look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 7. You know, so how do we fight? What weapons do we use? It says, by truthful speech and the power of God with weapons of righteousness for the right hand, and for the left. Sean struggled, but when it came down to it, he was truthful, he was honest, he was humble, and he was obedient to Jesus. We're gonna look at a couple of more scriptures, but hopefully, it's starting to connect. God fights our battles for us. He fights it for us as a church, as he did back in Isaiah's day, as he does for us in our day, and he will do for us personally if we're willing to be like Sean, to imitate Jesus. to take captive those thoughts that call us to be disobedient, to want discipling in our lives to be vulnerable and humble, when the crisis is there, we respond godly. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. I've never talked to a military person that has fought in battle that didn't, that told me, you know, I didn't wear my full armor. I've, I've yet to meet anybody that has actually fought in battle and said, you know, I, I didn't take my gun that day. Oh, I didn't, I didn't take my canteen. Oh, I forgot my helmet, but it was no biggie. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. When push came to shove and Satan was all on top of Sean, he saw the schemes. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, 
against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know, uh, there's been a lot of death over the last year. Over 500,000. But the death of a saint is joyous. The death of a saint is precious. That's Sean. Close out in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse four, for he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. You know, to the human eye, to the flesh, Sean was weak. He's in a wheelchair, amputated leg, major health issues. But see, the Bible tells us you can be healthy, strong to the eye. We're still weak. When it comes to this spiritual battle, you and I don't have a chance. There's no amount of money, no about going to the gym, no retirement plan, no great community or house or whatever it is that can defend you against this battle. But he says, in dealing with you, we will live by the power of God. Sean lived by the power of God. So as we get ready to go to the cross that Hoyt is gonna lead us in, man, I wanna encourage, don't be, Sad about Sean. <laughs> you want to be sad, be sad for yourself. <laughs> Take some lessons from his book. Imitate his life. Imitate his humility in Jesus. His willingness to be disciple. His humility of Jesus. His faith in the power of the cross. Because his body is resurrected now. That, that old thing that he was in, I know we can look at ourselves and think, oh, we're doing great physically. Yours is old too, just like mine, breaking down, withering away. We're weak, no matter how strong you might think you are. Church, I love you. Take care, and let's have a great communion.